Hello and warm welcome to you. I'm so glad that you've taken a couple minutes out of your very busy day to meet our 2023 Gallery Night Artists. I'm Denise Jess, Executive Director with the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Our mission here at the Council is to promote the dignity and empowerment of Wisconsinites who live with vision loss through advocacy, education, and vision services. For the past 12 years, we've participated in a citywide gallery night. And I just think it's such a powerful way for us to have our mission come alive, to feature artists who live with vision loss, who create incredible pieces of art. As you meet our artists and visit our virtual gallery on our website, I'm hoping this is a great opportunity for you to perhaps reshape your perceptions and stretch them about what it might mean to be an artist with vision loss. Hi, I'm Ellen Connor. I live in the village of Oregon, which is just a little bit south of Madison. Um, and I've been there, here, there for almost 30 years. I first got started in photography when my children were little, just because I was trying to take, you know, milestone pictures as things were happening. Um, at that point, I was, I had lost the vision in one eye when I was very young, but I still had pretty decent vision in the other eye. But then in about the last 10 or 15 years, I it started having some decreases in vision in, in the, the other eye as well. Um, and I had gotten interested in birding and had started hiking a little bit and um, wasn't able to see the birds or what colors they were anymore or um, really, you know, kind of see flowers or see details. Um, I started taking the pictures originally just to be able to blow them up on my computer so that I could see what it was. You know, the first time I did it, there was a bird at the back feeder in my backyard and I was trying to figure out what it was. It was a little bit bigger than than um, some of the wrens and sparrows. And so I was trying to see what it was. And I thought it was black, but when I actually took a picture of it and then put it on the computer, it was a bluebird. And so then I realized that was a pretty good way to be able to see things, you know, that way and still enjoy it. Um, so the photography's kind of changed as as my vision's gotten worse I've gotten more interested in kind of colors and patterns and things like that um, and, and some of my photographs you know really are not so much about a thing as they are about a pattern of color um, but I've really enjoyed it I've been I've started really enjoying a creative process that that you know it started out as something else but it it ended up um, being a, a kind of a fun way to create and to still enjoy nature, just enjoy it in a different way. As time has gone on, um, I've started, you know, I, I don't do any any kind of photography that, that's like a, you know, a big, large picture setting. I tend to like things that are small and up close um, because I can see, even though I'm not seeing the details in the flower, I can kind of see what color the flower is and notice Sometimes I notice that there's a bee on it, sometimes not. Sometimes that makes a good photograph. Um, but I've started to do more and more like that. I've started to use my phone more and more because I can enlarge things and it's very manageable. But so I get an idea of what it is that I'm, you know, that, that I've got what I wanted to photograph actually in, you know, the right field of vision. I found it really hard with a regular camera to use that little, you know, that, um, I don't know what to call it, that little screen where you kind of preview what you've done. Um, so, you know, I've started doing more and more this way. The other thing is that I don't see in the dark anymore. So I've, I've started taking things um, mostly in the morning and in the evening. And I really like the golden hour light that I can see better in that light than in other lights. And so that lets me um, sometimes make a better composition than I could at another time of day when the light's flat or when it's starting to get dark. So those are things that I do now that, you know, five or six years ago I wasn't doing. Um, the other thing is that, you know, I've quit worrying about the fact that I'm not seeing those things. 
and I'm just enjoying what I get out of the photographs now. Um, when I first went for some some um, training for some uh, computer work um, with the council, um, I was really kind of feeling like the loss of things, like the loss of being able to bird and the loss of being able to do the photography. And then I, um, I happened to see that there was a, a photograph, a big photograph on the wall of a squirrel in one of the offices. And um person who was doing my training mentioned that that was someone who, who, you know, who got services there at the council. And so it made me start thinking about doing things a little bit differently. Um, and it's, I think it's exciting. I love seeing over the last few years of the galleries, I love seeing what people, what people are doing, what ways they were expressing art through knitting or through um, carving or through painting or photography. Um, you know, it's something that I just, naively had believed I wasn't going to be able to do. And instead, you know, there are people who are creating really beautiful art um, with all types of, of visual loss. Um, I think that that's exciting. I, I think that's something that more people ought to know about. Yes. Uh, my name is Eli Santine. I'm a 18 year old high school student from Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. So I guess my sort of my beginnings as an artist they begin when, uh, as a child, I had a very active imagination, and I used to draw a lot, not necessarily as a form of self-expression, but to sort of get that the imagination in my mind and turn it into something tangible. So I, I was, video games were a way of life for me as a kid, so I often spent afternoons after school using Crayola marker and drawing fake video game covers for fake video games. And and then on my seventh birthday, I received a Samsung Galaxy tablet. And this was 2013. I would, and uh, at so early on after I had gotten the tablet, my sister Isabel, who also had a tablet, she found a stop motion application and that sort of opened up a whole new world for us because we were we were sort of little young amateur filmmakers in the making and with this stop motion app it opened up a whole new world of possibilities so fast forward to about age 12 and i got introduced to the simpsons and I don't understand, like, I I remember why I was so interested in it, but I, now thinking back, I don't really understand the logic behind it, because when I watched The Simpsons for the first time, I found it, I found the acting of the show very interesting. The characters would make a lot of gestures, and there was, there were instances of of what I would call smooth animation here and there, but, you know, thinking back now, I realized that the Simpson that the animation of the Simpsons was very rigid and mechanical and not really very good. But um, when but the Simpsons was really sort of the turning point for me because I sort of began to take art more seriously and I sort of began to de draw char legitimate characters and sort of develop my own drawing style. And my for, or in, my initial drawing style was really sort of um, an imitation of the Simpsons drawing style. So um, at, at age thirteen or fourteen, I discovered Ren and Stimpy, which as and I began researching it. There's a great book called Sick Little Monkeys, written by Thad Kramarowski, that's really sort of the definitive, comprehensive history of the making of the show and that book reading that sort of really sort of got me interested in considering animation as a serious career path for me so and also the show's sensibilities were much more free in terms of animation there was a lot more freedom in terms of drawing there were a lot it was a lot more expressiveness and dynamic posing and it, just better animation so after after getting involved with Ren and Stimpy, I also 
discovered the Golden Age cartoons of the 30s and 40s, you know, Looney Tunes, uh, Tex Avery, uh, Tom and Jerry, stuff like that. And that also opened up that also opened up to opened up a world of possibilities for me. So all this was sort of a natural progression. One thing sort of led to another. And um, when after I started having vision problems, I sort of discovered that I was in a bit of a rut artistically because I found it difficult to sort of develop my own style and draw in my own style. So after all the recent surgeries, I've had I had about four surgeries in the span of eight months. Um, I found that after this last surgery, I was really sort of able to draw again, and I was able to do it much more naturally, and I was able to do it much, and I was able to rely much more on my subconscious rather than sort of using intellect to envision the drawing in my head and try and replicate what I saw in my mind. So my inspirations artistically, artistically really come from my subconscious because I sort of now am more comfortable drawing in a natural style. And I my inspirations sort of, I guess I would say my inspirations are mainly other things besides art besides like drawing art like i'm inspired by music i'm inspired by video i'm inspired by film i'm inspired by all these things and i sort of take those little elements of all those inspirations and sort of translate the essence of my thoughts and feelings and sensibilities into my art evelyn becker and i live in sun prairie wisconsin I need to do something with my hands. I just cannot sit still. And painting is kind of out for me. I can't do much of following the lines and stuff. I know other people paint when they're blind, but I just can't seem to figure it out. So I reverted back to being younger and doing things with uh, crocheting. And I started crocheting the rugs. And I don't like the idea of being in a certain format, like is it right, doing bands of color, you know, a certain number of rows, all the same color, and then switch to another color. So I decided that I was going to do mine differently. And since I like numbers, and for some reason I picked the number 198, and I do 198 stitches of one color and 198 stitches of the next color. And I've already prearranged the colors into some uh, order. Like it goes from like in this rug, it go, or Afghan, it goes from light blue to a different shade of blue and, and it goes out to blues. And then I flip it over and go from blues to green. I flip the colors, not the Afghan. I flip the colors. So that's what I decided to make was an Afghan to do something different. And since I like blue, most of the colors are blue. Yes, of course, I can't see the colors, okay? And when I came across, I had a lot of different colors of yarn here. And then I just kept buying different colors of blue. And then I asked my daughters to come over, and I, and I, you can't tell by the name of the color what it really looks like, okay? So I had them describe the colors to me. And we had them spread out all over my bed, and we put them in order, and I put um, numbers on them in Braille, Braille, because at that time I didn't have the pen friend. I put um, Braille labels on with a Braille labeler, and I did, you know, like one through, I forget how many colors I used in there. And I just kept them in that order, and I could tell by the number what order they were supposed to be in. So the, and they were in bags, Ziploc bags, because if you use an open bag, balls of yarn escape. They love to get out of the bag and run all over the place. And um, I just kept them in the bags. And when I took a color out, I put it back in its bag. And that's, that's how I organized the colors. The, this 
blue afghan. I made it last year. So this year I decided to make my grandson wanted an afghan. And I said to him, what colors do you want? He said, Star Wars. Now, that's a lot of colors, okay? So I put them off for a while. And then I decided to make a Star Wars picture with the yarn. And I tried to decide how do you do strips of color. So it took me a while to imagine if you take something full grown, say say a red car, okay, and you want to put the red car in a strip, well, how do you do that? You only have one, literally just one dimension, okay, and you take and you smash that car and lay it out flat in the strip so it becomes a strip of color. And so I made pictures with strips of colors, I hope. That's my newest one. Hi, uh, my name is Zach Cedrali. Uh, I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I've been uh, working as a professional artist since 2006. I, I studied in San Francisco, um, got my master's there, and uh, moved back a little bit after that. Uh, I lost most of my vision in 2010 due to a pituitary tumor. And... Um, but I've continued to paint. Uh, when I was in the hospital with that, I met Marshall Flax, who introduced me to uh, this, Council of the Blind, and invited me to the show, a show he was doing then, and I couldn't do it. Um, but I saw the news that it was back up this year, as it is every year, I, I believe, with gallery night. And, uh, and I was able to participate. I'm glad to, to have been able to. Well, so this happened pretty early in my career, I, but I was established. So yeah, it was, um, it changed things. I mean, painting is always kind of a struggle. I feel like I'm always trying to figure it out. Like I'm not there yet. So this was, this just added a whole new dimension to, to the problems I was facing and having to solve. So, um, one was finding the right size, like what's going to be comfortable here. I used to work, uh, on a larger scale, so I scaled down and I kind of had to find that, that sweet spot between too small and too large. So that kind of changed things. Um, like I said, the, the subject matter, all of that has been evolving. That It would have been evolving no matter what. It, some things were encouraged by uh, my inability to um, get tight, tight with details now, because I just can't get in there with the teeny brushes. Um, so it's sort of, um, it's, uh, it was a little bit of a catalyst for me to get looser and more expressive in my mark making. Now it's still, it's still, I consider it realism, but there are some more expressive elements that I introduce with, with the brushwork and color. Uh, I guess a good example of that would be the, the work I did with disrupted realism where the paint just goes from being an abstract representation to an absolute blur and, and smut, pure abstraction. Um, that, that was partially a result of, of my frustration with trying to, to do the work I wanted to do with the limitations I had. And at that moment, I just sort of embraced it. And since then, I've been kind of, Balancing that with with the more uh, realistic, tight, tight renderings, but is, I'm kind of landing in this happy medium where I know what I, I'm just not able to do and I don't want to force it. And then what I, what I can do and it's still exciting. Um, technically, uh, I've just, I have to stand a lot further back to see what I'm doing. And whenever I can, I use really really long paint brushes there they've got 18 inch handles so with my arm fully extended and then another 18 inches i can get quite a ways back in and far enough back where i can see the full painting and that really really has helped i can only speak to what i'm working on now and it's just it's more a figurative work uh with less of the abstraction involved 
just some distortions of the figure. And that's the direction I see myself going into now. I really can't predict what will go on then. I, I've been lately really influenced by Rodan, who just had a great exhibition in uh, at the Pain in Oshkosh. Um, and I've been studying him previously. And, and he he's interpreting the figure. So it's a less reliant on strict ob observation. It's an interpretation. So he's reacting to the figure and he's distorting it, but in informed ways. And um, that's kind of, that's the direction I see myself going. Uh, I teach drawing at UW-Whitewater. Um, I also teach for the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. I do that online. And I also teach here in Madison with MSCR, uh, adult uh, art classes. Yeah, I am. Um, I occasionally bring my my ID cane, um, and that's just so that when I'm maneuvering between everybody's stations, I'm not bumping into them and kicking chairs and kicking their easels. It still happens. Um, I usually give everybody the heads up, like I I can't see you if you're over here, so just be aware. Like I'll do my best, but it, it helps them to know. Um, but otherwise, you know, the concepts I'm teaching haven't changed. So I just, I keep doing it. I, I don't think about it sometimes at all. And then other times I'm very aware. So I always wonder, I always wonder, but it, it hasn't come up. Um, I think most of them have looked at my work before signing up to, to take classes from me. So they they see what I do and they I guess just trust it. Okay, so my name is Darla Weber, and I am the daughter of Gerald Johnson. Uh, we both lived in in Medford, Wisconsin. Um, I say lived as my dad passed away this this early this year, uh, and uh, so he cannot be here. Um, so I am uh, I am responding on his behalf. Uh, my uh, dad was a lifetime artist uh, and woodworker and uh, really enjoyed uh, working with the Wisconsin Council of Blind. I know that uh, you had shown one of his tables in past years as well. So we are happy to donate on his behalf two tables to the Wisconsin Council of Blind for the art show. Yeah, so he was, like I said, a lifetime artist uh, from young on. Uh, he, I think, started with painting, oil painting. Uh, we still have a, one of his paintings, but uh, he, he quickly evolved to woodworking and really found his passion there. Uh, he was a member of the Wisconsin Master Craftsman Guild and several other associations with their uh, rules and bylaws and was always happy to share his craft and his knowledge with others and learn from others as well. Um, but he he worked with a lot of different mediums, uh, stone and masonry as well. Um, I actually still have a castle, small castle and, and a lighthouse that he built, hand chipped the stones and masoned the crafting a working lighthouse um, in miniature scale, obviously. Uh, so the, the lighthouse is dated 1957. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> but uh, he, he worked in plaster craft as well, sculpting plaster. Um, one year he, he created a reindeer with a working red nose <laughs> um, out of plaster. Uh, he he did uh, so many different things, but um, wood was really his his medium. Uh, it uh, became more difficult for him um, as he got older um, because his uh, you know he had to start wearing readers to be able to see close and use magnifying glasses and and lights and. Uh, things to do the woodworking, and uh, and then it evolved to um, 
having um, the, the um, mac macular degeneration, um, which meant he couldn't see anything center. It was all periphery. So his, uh, his techniques and what he did evolved over time to compensate for that. Um, and instead of doing the really fine detailed work that his eyes didn't allow any longer, uh, he, he began to do um, more broader spectrum things. Uh, and tables was one of those things um, because it didn't require a lot of close-up visual. And he was able to use, uh, you know, the, the, his lifelong woodworking skills and touch to be able to, to craft live edge tables with smooth surfaces and uh, um, always uh, strive to use the naturalist um, materials as possible. So uh, natural log pieces for the, the, uh, the feet or legs of the table. So uh, sometimes incorporating driftwood uh, and stumps. So that was, um, that was easier for him with the loss of the vision. Hello, my name is Richard Burkholz. Uh, I grew up in Brookville, Wisconsin. I'm now living in Madison, uh, Wisconsin right now. And I'm doing some uh, clay uh, here at Artworking along with some fire starters as well. Um, the woman who got me started making my fire starters, her name is Kristen Gilbertson. And she's the one who got me started making my fire stars. I used to use melted uh, scented candles for my scent, for my wax scents, my fire starters. And now I use uh, soy wax. And I and I add my different scents to, to my fire starters. My scents for my fire starters are lavender, pine, and citronella. I'll keep the mosquitoes and the bugs away. And also some unscented fire starters as well. So those you get six of them for seven dollars right now. For, for my for my mat for my mask, I roll out some clay, and I do know how to make an eye and a nose and a mouth. And um, I've seen a lot of rock and roll shows before, so I, a lot of times I name my mask after some of the bands I've seen in concert, like David Bowie. I named that mask "Fame," a song by David Bowie, and so I name, I name a lot of my mass after the musicians that I've seen in concert. Yes, I know, like last night, uh, Jimmy here at our work, she and I went outside and I picked some leaves off of uh, two different trees here in front of our working. And um, I pushed the the chair. We have a cherry tree here at our working. And I pressed the, the cherries and the leaves into the, my clay mug that I'm making here. So I did that yesterday with Jimmy yesterday here at our working. Oh yes, also right now at our working here too. I'm making these uh, these tall vessels. I make some uh, vases. I'll call them vases so I can charge more for them. But I call them vases. And, uh, <laughs> I make some uh, make these lids now. Um, and also make like a, a little pinch top so I can put, take you take the lid off this uh, a vessel and put it back on as well. And we could make those for, um, um, like for flour, for sugar, for like baking needs, you know, in your kitchen. So we have like four of those made right now. And I also have like some, I also make some mugs out of clay also. And, um, and what else have I made here? Doing your teapot? Oh, yes, I'm making a teapot as well. I make these very, very small little, uh, little tea mugs as well. They're almost like for children where you put my finger, my index finger into the, the handle. So they're much smaller tea cups that I've made in the past, you know. So, well, I do make some, you do, I, I first, first I make a little pinch pot out of clay. And then um, uh, the woman I work with, Lily May, she'll like, cut it off square on top. And then I uh, I take, a, it's called a serrated rib. And, uh, and I also make these coils, these long tubes of clay about a foot long. And she'll come and she'll like pre-measure some of the coils, 
so they're the right length. And I take the serrated rib, it's like a little rake, and I rub up the top of the, the pinch pot. And then I, uh, I I add some, it's called slip. And I add some slip on top of the pinch pot. And then I, I rough up the, the coil in front of me as well. And then I add that coil to the pinch pot. And then I add another, and once that's finished, and then I add another coil on top of that last coil. And then I, I rough up with, with, with the straight rib, I rough up the outside of the, of the, of the, of the I'll say the mug or the bowl. And I also rough the inside with, with, with the straight rib tool that I use. And then I will uh, take and use a, a flattened tool. It's like a little spatula. And it'll smooth it all off inside and out. So it's nice and smooth inside and out. And that's why I keep on adding the coils to the clay, same mug. And once I get it tall enough, then I'll add a handle to it. And, um, and after I finish it, then it, after I finish my clay, it first has to be uh, bisque fired in the kiln. And once I get it out from being bisque fired, then I take some sandpaper and I feel the piece of clay that's, that just came out of the kiln, you know, and I will, I will sand, I'll put a mask on, then I will sand it off my, my, my bowl and my mugs, you know, so they're so much smoother. And after I smooth those all off, then I, I, then I glaze the mug or the bowl, and then they're sent, I use a paintbrush with, with some glaze. After I glaze the piece inside and out, if it's a mug, then it's sent back to the kiln a second time. To melt all the glaze onto the um, onto the onto the mug, you know, so that's how I kind of finish the pieces. It's always nice making things myself, so that other people can use them, like a mug or a bowl, and or a um, or 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 vase, you know. My name is Judy Sahawiak. I'm from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, out in the country where it's beautiful. Well, my mother knitted a lot. And so she taught me when I was about 10 or 11 years old. And I just found it, found it very soothing, very calming. And I had different ideas. In the beginning, I always followed the pattern and I did it as I was supposed to do. And then after a while, I just became more creative with it and put my own little spin on different things. And it turned out interesting. <laughs> I make a lot of sweaters. I, I make sweaters all different sizes, and I've been giving them away to, uh, there's a grade school that's nearby, and uh, I'd like to give a few uh, sweaters to them. Uh, and if anybody needs them, they're there. I make hats. Um, and then I just make things that well, I used to make afghans, but now I'm working on something right now that is like a shawl. Uh, but it, it's, I, I think I would uh, call it a cape. And uh, I'm not sure how it's going to turn out, but we'll see. I have a, a really bright light uh, that I have three different brightnesses of light. And that is right over my head. Uh, I use different, if I have a, uh, a dark yarn, I use a silver needle. And if I have a light colored yarn, I use a dark needle. So I have that um, difference in color so that I'm able to uh, to see it better. It's also by feel. Uh, the needles that I use are, I like the square needle better than, uh, that's a relatively new one to me anyway. Instead of a round needle, it's a square needle on a circular cord and uh, so that you have both needles together. And uh, the, there's something about that square needle that the feel in my hands, just it just helps to know where I am at. I'm not going to ever stop. If I have to, if I have to knit and not see what I'm doing, I've already practiced doing that. Uh, I can't do any lace stitches or anything like that. But my, uh, I, I, I try to do something so that I would be lost if I couldn't knit. <laughs> so I'm sure I would figure something out. <laughs> my name is Jim Fromey. 
and I was born in Black Earth, Wisconsin, uh, but, and I went to the university here, and when I left Wisconsin, I traveled a great deal throughout, really, the world and spent a lot of time in various places, uh, but now I've returned to Madison, uh, and I'm living here now with uh, my daughter and her family. Um, I have been interested in uh, activities, not really thinking of them as art, but just activities that fit with my interest for many years. Um, it so happens that I had great interest in fly fishing as I was growing up and in high school, I didn't know how to tie a fly, but I had interest in that. And I read uh, Isaac Walton's book, The Complete Angler, and he had a friend that wrote a uh, addendum to that book called The 12 Flies of the Year to Use for Trout Fishing. And I, read that with interest and still didn't know anything, but I tried to find out things and just didn't happen. But when I was a junior in high school, I had an unfortunate accident. It was a compound skull fracture, which paralyzed my right arm. And as a rehab activity, they suggested you know mechanical things that would help my mobility of my fingers and so forth. And my family had the insight to get me a fly tying kit that had the instruments that were necessary to fly to, to tie flies. And they also got me a book called Flies by J. Edison Leonard, which had many color uh, pictures in there, how to tie flies and the materials to use and so forth. And that was a great help. And I tied flies for tr my own personal trout trout fishing adventures, and from for different friends and so forth, and uh, used them my whole life. Uh, then, when I retired, uh, that was about twenty five years ago, I took an interest in salmon flies. and I started tying salmon flies, and this was something very interesting to me, not just because of the, I will call it art, because it's referred to as an art. Um, it, it had many exotic feathers embedded in that activity. And so there was the interest to just collect the feathers. And I went to England and different places to find feathers I couldn't find here. And that was a, a lot of fun for me. Uh, late, a little bit later, maybe two or three years later after I started that, I had a dear friend named Steve, Steve Field, I still do, and he was, um, he, he was a world-class artist. He was very good at wood carving uh, and painting. <clears throat> and anyway, he taught at the, uh, well, the uh, technical college here in Madison. And at one time, he said, Jim, you should take an interest in wood carving. And I said, Steve, I can't even draw a fish. How could I carve one? And he said, if you can do those salmon flies, you can carve. So I took up carving at that time. And I've enjoyed that uh, up until now. So with the wood carving, um, uh, the tools I use for wood carving are several, actually. I use, first of all, um, a bandsaw to cut the the, prod, the, the the thing I'm carving to get the dimensions about right and the shape generally where I'd like it to be. Um, the wood that I use to, for carving almost exclusively is, is basswood. And I use basswood because it's relatively soft and it keeps an edge. So it's a very nice wood to work with. Um, I use gouges and 
sanders and things of that sort to uh, get the shape down further and get it to the point where I can actually see what I'm doing and what what I'm how it's turning out and then um, with the scales for example on fish I use a burning tool to do each scale individually and one fish has in the neighborhood of 10,000 scales so that each one of those is apply, applied separately and uh, the fish uh, we use glass eyes as the means for getting a nice realistic eye and I use an airbrush basically to uh, color the fish and um, I use acrylic paints water-based paints as the uh, paint medium so as time went on with my hobbies um, I found and I didn't I don't know if I actually consciously sought this but at a certain point I built a shop in my garage in Prior Lake, Minnesota when we were living there and that was after I retired and um, I put a nice light on the east side of that shop so I would get the morning light and have nice working conditions and I got an actual light that I used to augment the daylight and I did a workbench and I brought put my saw and my router and my sander and my tools uh, in that shop and that helped. Uh, then I got trifocals and they were a big assist because with the trifocal I had the big, bigger part of the lens in my glasses were nor for my normal vision. Then I had an area for reading and um, you know, looking at my work, for example, in a global sense, I didn't have to look at a small area. But then, when it came to doing the detail work, I could use the the third level of vision, and that was very helpful. I found that very helpful. I didn't have to keep changing glasses to put a different correction in in my on my uh, head wow wasn't that amazing to hear from our artists if you'd like to see their work directly you can visit our online gallery by navigating to our website at wcblind.org go to the events tab and down to gallery night and you'll be able to enter the virtual gallery there Every piece is pictured and also has an image description so that our gallery is fully accessible to all visitors. Some of the pieces are available for purchase with a portion of the purchase benefiting the Council. If you'd like to give a gift to the Council to support events like this and other vision services and advocacy endeavors, please consider a gift at the donate button on the website. And lastly, if you are a Wisconsin artist with vision loss, we would love to hear from you. Please send us an email at info at wcblind.org and watch our publications next summer for our annual call for artists.